Hi, welcome to today's webinar, Field and Laboratory Navigation Warfare Simulation, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Spirant Federal Systems. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, type it in the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue, and I or technical support specialist Marie Emmerich will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, and email address in the panel located on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share this webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget you'll see in the bottom left corner of the screen. Finally, at the bottom right of the console, you will find a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download, and a link to visit Spirant Federal's website. I'm Aurora Harris, content marketing producer for GPS World, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Today, we will be hearing from Paul Benschuf, technical director of the 746 Test Squadron. Next, we will hear from Jan Ackerman, director of product line management at the Spirant Communications Position, Navigation and Timing Business Unit. And lastly, we will be hearing from Christopher Hogstrom, Manager in Product Development at Spirit Federal. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. Take it away. Thank you, Aurora. And uh, thank you, everybody, for giving me an opportunity to chat with you this morning. At least it's morning where I am. Um, as you heard, I'm Paul Benchu, Technical Director for the 746 Test Squadron, known to some of you as the central inertial and GPS test facility. And today I'd like to share some of the ways we use GNSS simulations to drive some of our PNT testing, uh, not only in the laboratory, but also in the field. Um, so our organization's chartered mission is to test and evaluate PNT systems. Uh, testing is one thing, and we'll discuss that quite a bit in the coming slides, but evaluation implies a, a deeper understanding of a system's behavior. And to gain that level of understanding, you'll often need a degree of uh, testing repeatability uh, to achieve uh, an appropriate uh, statistical significance in the data. And simulations allow us to do that. Um, and our vision simply states that not only do we want to do this, but we want to do it in the best possible manner uh, efficiently so that we're not wasting time and money and with agility so that we can tailor our scenarios to get the best possible data, even if that means taking our test capability uh, to another location and then ultimately producing test results that you can count on. Um, Doing so requires continual improvement, and that's what we strive to do. And in terms of simulations, that means applying state-of-the-art tools um, and, and, and validating our scenarios, um, and leveraging them correctly into our testing. So in a nutshell, we provide an entire spectrum of test and evaluation assets uh, suitable for developmental test articles at very low uh, technical readiness levels uh, all the way up to supporting operational testing. So throughout the life of a complete test program, uh, we can use a crawl, walk, run approach uh, to ring out problems early in the, in the developmental cycle to ensure a higher probability of success uh, later in the program where testing is more expensive and you know major changes to the unit under test become increasingly more difficult to achieve. 
So in terms of our capabilities, we started back in the late 50s as the DOD's uh, Inertial Guidance and Navigation Test Center. It was at the height of the Cold War uh, when a lot of emphasis was on intercontinental ballistic missiles and other strategic weapons. And back then, everything was inertially guided, which is really why we're located at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. It's a seismically quiet area and fairly remote away from a lot of cultural disturbances, which allows us to evaluate inertial uh, components and systems uh, with strategic levels of accuracy. Then, as some of you might remember, in the late 80s and early 90s, the Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union broke up, and in case you hadn't noticed, peace broke out all over the world, or at least that's what some people thought. Um, anyway, because of this, a lot of the ICBM programs were canceled and strategic inertial testing started to wane in favor of a new system that was being fielded, and that was GPS. So we transitioned a lot of testing to GPS, focusing on uh, all three segments to make sure the system worked as designed. Uh, but fortunately, we didn't divest of all inertial testing because, as many of you know, inertial and GPS technologies complement each other uh, very well and integrate together very well, uh, yielding very robust uh, guidance and navigation systems. So we found ourselves to be well suited for evaluating these combined technologies. Um, Unfortunately, as GPS became more powerful and prevalent as a military tool, our adversaries became more interested in uh, taking that capability away from us. And this drove us to begin evaluating GPS in navigation warfare environments that we could assess uh, system vulnerabilities and recommend some corrective action. Now to do all of this, using the crawl walk run approach uh, that I talked about, we recommend starting with modeling and simulation. And to do this here, we have a couple of different laboratories uh, that are armed with the tools we need to either uh, directly inject simulated signals into systems under test or to radiate signals in either a test chamber or through an antenna hood to exercise antenna electronics. And after that, we can take the system out to the range and work co-located with the White Sands Missile Range that gives us thousands of square miles of controlled uh, range and airspace. Um, so we use that to do some low dynamic ground testing. And we have a number of vehicles uh, which are designed specifically for this. And if the test program requires it, we can also set up and drive through a variety of navigation warfare or, or nav war environments uh, we have the largest fleet of jammers in the U.S., and we can use these assets to create virtually any jamming scenario. And of a, uh, particular interest is our ET and CET, which is emerging threat and complex emerging threat assets, um, which can produce what you know the industry might call spoofing effects. And there are a number of techniques that can be applied either, you know, well, they each have their pros and cons, let's put it that way. And it's something that we look at very carefully. And then finally, if warranted, we can also fly the system under test in both uh, benign and, and nav war environments. And we have a number of aircraft at our disposal that we routinely employ, but others can bring their own test beds if, if that's what they want. The interesting challenge here is being able to measure our results against an accurate truth source especially if you're traveling through an environment where GPS is uh, compromised or, or uh, unreliable. So in these cases, we'll employ our UHARs, which can deliver submeter accuracy in GPS denied environments. And one of the non-GPS positioning sensors in that suite is Locata. And we have the world's largest located network instrumented on the north part of the range specifically for this kind of reference support. Now, when it comes to uh, GNSS simulation, the yellow boxes here show where this is usually leveraged. And as you can see, most of those applications are early in a test program. So they're great tools for validating performance or identifying problems early in a product's developmental cycle. 
Okay, this is a quick snapshot of our GNSS simulation capabilities, uh, starting with lab and site testing, meaning we can either do the testing at our facility or at yours. Uh, we can use our simulation to validate models, to replicate satellite signals and produce uh, control segment messages, which can be useful for validating system performance or for anomaly resolution. Um, earlier during MCO development, these tools were uh, invoked you know, fairly regularly to perform trade studies on different approaches that were being considered. And then, of course, we can also produce jamming and spoofing signals in the lab. This is particularly effective uh, in that we don't need to secure authorizations to broadcast these signals outdoors. And in the case of producing some of our more sensitive signals, we don't need to worry about them being compromised. Uh, next for our in situ weapon testing, a lot of GPS enabled weapons receive their positioning info from the aircraft or, or the platform that's carrying them. So even if the weapons GPS is functioning correctly, if the Air Force is not handing over the commands correctly, the system isn't gonna work, especially if the command contains an extended SASM or M code function. So in these cases, we evaluate the entire integrated system, simulating those extended functions and radiate, uh, radiating them into the platform. Uh, these tools are what we call SASMizer or, or Miser. Um, and of course, we can also radiate within an RF chamber, uh, uh, which is next on the list. Uh, we have one on site, which is currently used for checkouts, but will hopefully be certified for conducting other tests soon. In the meantime, we can take our simulations to other certified chambers for testing. Um, for flight simulator, uh, testing. We have generic tools in our laboratories, but often take our simulations to other system integration laboratories to enhance uh, uh, their test capabilities and inform you know, software developments or their test programs. And then finally, we embrace collaboration with other government labs uh, to develop common standards and, and compare results. So that's what we're doing with our laboratory simulations. In terms of the specific equipment we use, our most advanced simulators are the Spirant 9790s. Uh, these are great in that they deliver individual output for uh, each simulated satellite, uh, which is perfect for testing in anechoic chambers or for SERPA testing when you really need spatial diversity. And it's also nice that we can pretty much uh, simulate any GNSS constellation um, uh, that's useful for replicating a realistic spectrum or for testing hybrid receivers. Uh, we also have a number of older model simulators, which aren't quite as flexible, but still work quite well. And as discussed, we have a number of RF hoods to support integrated system evaluation. Um, a lot of arbitrary waveform generators for creating NAVOR environments. We have GPS discipline oscillators for synchronizing components in our simulations. Um, and cesium clocks for scenarios where frequency stability is particularly important, such as you know, simulating the GPS master clock or, or some of the SV clocks. And then finally, we have something called FANG. It's a wavefront simulation capability for laboratory SERPA testing. So together, these tools give us an extraordinary test capability that allows us to protect our classified signals and eliminate any testing constraints, such as needing a radio frequency authorization uh, to broadcast outside uh, or uh, provide a controlled environment for uh, you know, developing procedures or countermeasures or repeatable scenarios. So in terms of uh, the types of things that we simulate, obviously a, a satellite simulator uh, is useful for replicating the space segment. Um, we can use our simulators to uh, simulate multiple space vehicles. Uh, I already discussed that we have 
a number of a number of of GNSS constellations. We can uh, control power levels, all orbits, antenna patterns, you name it. Very flexible, and we can either create what we would call a uh, truthful uh, uh, a truthful environment uh, in that it's exactly what we see outside or it can be an optimized environment what it's supposed to do and unfortunately uh, our, our satellite environment isn't always what it should be so in those cases we can we can replicate what we actually see and, and use it for anomaly resolution figure out what's going wrong and correct the space environment so that it's delivering the correct signals um, this is an example of our direct inject bench testing. Uh, here, you know, we, we kind of show an, an, an EGI in the center of the picture, and we'll connect that to a data acquisition system to collect the data. Um, we also need to uh, uh, hook up a uh, control and data display and, and something to, uh, to, to operate the, the equipment. This would be your, your normal setup, but in order to drive the simulation, of course, we need to, to add a simulator. So uh, in this case, we would be adding a GNSS constellation. Uh, and uh, yeah, because an EGI in this case also has inertial, we would use our sim inertial capability uh, to, uh, to uh, simulate uh, the delta Vs and delta thetas. Um, if it happens to be a, a nav war test, we can inject some EW signals as well. Um, if there's uh, aiding uh, truth data that, that needs to be broadcast, such as barometric or, or radar, we can do that as well. So the goal in our benchtop testing is to accurately generate RF signals. Uh, um, that would be representative of what you'd see in operational use. So you want to have a, 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 a true GPS environment. You want to have a representative EW environment, if that's the goal of your test. Uh, but that's not all. You also want to make sure that you're replicating the antenna patterns that are involved, um, any body masking that you would project uh, based on the particular platform. Uh, if you're on the ground, there may be some terrain masking that you, you need to take into account as well. And as I mentioned, uh, if it's uh, a combined system that has more than GPS, uh, we need to generate those other sensor inputs. So uh, barometric uh, uh, altitude or radar altitude is a, a big one when, uh, when we're testing EGIs. Uh, but there are plenty of other sensors to take into consideration depending on the unit under test. Ultimately, our goal here is to provide that controlled, repeatable, and secure environment. And if we do this early, uh, you can reduce the need for flight testing later and all of the associated costs that go along with that. I did mention our antenna hood testing. This is a, a very important uh, resource that we invoke regularly for uh, operational weapons platforms, uh, the users of those platforms don't like us going in and unhooking cables to inject a simulation. Uh, they're, they're very particular about the way they're configured. So it's better for us to uh, uh, radiate our simulations through an antenna hood, put the antenna hood over their antenna and get our simulations into the system that way. Um, and in using this methodology, we can invoke an end-to-end -end system test you know, all the way from the antenna through the platform down to the wing where, uh, where the GPS-enabled weapon might be. So we have the SASMizer uh, for, um, for doing SASM validation. We also have a, a version of it we call the Miser, which is the M-code version of it. Here's an example of a test that we did a while back uh, for Excalibur. It's an artillery round. Um, we did provide all of the, uh, uh, the uh, truth signals and the jamming signals. And we did uh, this testing using a couple of different methodologies. We actually had a fixture to rotate the projectile while we were uh, uh, 
uh, radiating the the uh, the simulation. But then we also uh, use the uh, projectile in a fixed manner and simulated the uh, uh, the uh, rotation. And this gave us uh, a lot of rigor in our test and, and validated our models uh, when we saw that we were getting the same results using both methodologies. Anyway, it's a very successful program. It's, it's being used now and you know, out there winning wars and saving lives, which is what our goal is. Um, today, we find that many of our GPS systems are, are uh, embedded so it may not even be a GPS system. It may be a comm system. It may be uh, some other type of a nav system that just has GPS embedded in it. We need to evaluate the entire system where GPS is just part of it. Simulation allows us to do that. And these are just uh, some of the examples where we're using those, uh, these approaches to inject uh, GPS simulations into an overall test. And then finally, uh, augmented reality. This is where we, we uh, inject a simulated signal, but combine it with live signals to, to uh, give users um, uh, you know, what we call augmented reality. So an example would be uh, a really high fidelity flight simulator where the pilot's flying through a virtual world and we want to be able to control that world. Uh, this really allows that full immersion for, for the pilot and the air crew uh, to help with uh, uh, training and, and development of tactics. So in summary, uh, that's what we do at the 746 test squadron. We have a, a wide array of test and evaluation capabilities. Um, we have our inertial sensors. We have our uh, GNSS simulation laboratories. Uh, we, we can take those assets to chambers, we can use them in the field um, and, uh, and uh, either at Holloman or, or other people's facilities. We can do integrated guidance systems and uh, uh, open air and nav war. Um, the, the real advantage of laboratory GNSS simulation is it, it gives us the ability to test early uh, ring out uh, problems uh, or potential challenges early in the program. That's the, the least expensive way to, to develop a product. Um, in doing so, we can protect our classified signals. We don't need the, uh, the RFAs or any artificial constraints. Um, and it's perfect for getting that uh, uh, repeatable ability to, uh, uh, to develop our uh, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, or any countermeasures. And then finally, I, I gave a couple of quick examples of how we use GNSS simulation uh, to uh, to give us augmented reality opportunities to, to really give us good operator in the loop testing and full immersion training of pilots and, and air crews. So with that, I think we're going to save questions to the end. So. Uh, for right now, I think I'm just going to hand this off to Jan for the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Very interesting presentation and, well, an impressive set of capability you've got over there at Holloman. So I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes about in-field simulation and spoofing testing. And it's actually going to be centered and I'm going to go to the agenda briefly. We're going to introduce a product which very recently joined the Spiron product family, where I'm going to say a few words around that product, and then we're going to go to common use cases where it is being used. And then I think the last section, something I'm personally very excited about, we're also going to look at the results uh, of some real world use of that product. So that product is uh, Spiron's new field simulator. So it is a spiral simulator that we brought down into a significantly reduced form factor. You can see it here on the left-hand side. Um, it is as small as 11 by 8.5 by 3.2 inches, and we've got another variant which is especially slightly taller. Um, we do, and the reason why the left-hand side is slightly taller, because we do offer that with an inbuilt reference receiver that we can modify or tailor towards customer needs. Um, that reference gives us the ability to optionally 
synchronize that with live sky or on the right hand side for example we can also provide it with a rack mount case that small form factor simulator runs to full breadth of spiron's simulation speed simgen it can support dual frequency and multi-constellation operation it is made in a way so that it's fairly lean in terms of power consumption so you can run it off an external battery pack um, you can control this if you want the GUI with it we can supply it with a control laptop or you can stream remote commands on there from another workstation straight on there because our engine is running on an inbuilt uh, CPU in there we do offer low and high power RF outputs so you can have um, nominal reference level as well as higher power levels out of the same box and it does support our full portfolio of commercial or open signals but it does currently not support any classified signals a few key specifications so we can support a total of 36 channels it runs at 100 hertz iteration rate it gives a pseudo range accuracy of three millimeters and as i alluded to already we do offer low power ports which give you nominal gnss signal levels so minus uh, 130 dbm for gps l1 ca but we do have a high power port which is uh, at minus 60 dbm and then we also offer control over the power or to bring that up another 15 dB at 0.1 dB resolution. It is ruggedized to a degree, so it can operate from zero degrees Celsius to 50 degrees. It can operate in fairly humid conditions up to 90% and on condensing, and it can also uh, deal with a degree of altitude as well. Moving on, um, one thing I've alluded to is the ability to have a inbuilt reference receiver within the same enclosure and this ruggedized enclosure, which gives a live sky synchronization capability. And we can support different receiver types. The way that works is um, we pass the Rhinex data from the receiver, we arm the scenario, and you can see a 1 PPS and 10 MAC connection as well. And then you hit a trigger button, and then the simulator is going to start in very close smaller than 100 nanosecond alignment to a live sky signal. Um, they're actually the software utility around it is called Spiron Standpoint, and that is actually also available with the rest of our portfolio, be that the 9000s or the 9790s that Paul mentioned earlier. So while well, moving on, what are the use cases of that new field simulator? So one of the key use cases that I'm also going to talk a bit more about in, in the real world example is in speed spoofing testing. Because what is the um, problem that we, that is, well, that um, well, testers face when wanting to evaluate against spoofing in real world conditions? Well, you need a very realistic signal, but you also need a large level control over the signal in order to figure out what different effects or di well, what effects different, well, different settings have. And you need to really be able to control that signal in a very precise manner. And in order to actually pose a, well, a real threat, you also need to be able to synchronize it very closely to live sky because otherwise every receiver is going to throw out a signal that's fairly well out of sync with the live sky. So the solution for that, well, obviously is the field simulator both gives that level of control through that proven SimGen software that's been used in laboratory environment for decades. And then together with the um, uh, live sky synchronization through standpoint in the inbuilt reference receiver that offers a real powerful test vector uh, for spoofing in the field. Another use case that we've observed is that, well, I'd say the classic simulator portfolio is, is obviously made for lab bench testing and bringing it out in the open in terms of power supply, weight, form factor, all of those things is can be onerous. So the field simulator, due to its size, loan form factor and ability to run off a battery, you can move that between test locations fairly easily and store it fairly easily, uh, put it in the back of a vehicle, bring it somewhere else, and you have that test asset at your disposal much, much easier. So 
Now, going into that real world use example. Um, so first of all, uh, well, this is a case study who actually done all that testing. It was the WD61 from the German Armed Forces, the Bundeswehr. Um, and the WD61's mandate is the evaluation of military aircraft and aerial weapon systems. So first of all, many thanks to uh, the WD61 for partnering with us and uh, allowing us to present this interesting case study at this webinar. And uh, what was the mandate of this specific spoofing test? And uh, it is uh, testing of spoofing as a counter UV measure in a real world open sky test environment. And below there, you can actually see a, well, the actual test setup um, in a mountainous area uh, in Europe um, with some of the reference antennas and so on placed. Um, so what was the test setup? I think first important bit, it is a secure parameter, both with, an, um, well, with a license to transmit the, 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 uh, to transmit the spoofing signals and other EW signals, as well as, well, in general, fenced off, um, yeah, to, to ensure no disturbance of the testing or no disturbance of the testing towards somebody else. An important aspect, and I'll have some pictures to prove that later, is experienced drone pilots, um, because, well, yeah, if, if you are interfering with drone operation, um, that can lead to some unexpected movements, and you want to make sure that you keep that under a degree of control. There is a tri tripod reference antenna for the reference receiver. You can see that here in yellow, and a spoofing transmit antenna over here. Um, the signals used for spoofing in this instance has been because of the devices that were um, tested. There's a, it's um, L1 only, GPS L1, Galileo AE1, and GLONASS L1. Again, multi frequency is supported if needed. In this case, because of the um, well uh, devices that were tested, it was L1 only. The target power at the DUT was uh, set to minus 90 dBm. Obviously, there's a lot of free space loss in there, which is always a nasty thing. Um, so the high power output fully cranked up at minus 45 dBm was used. Another 25 dB gain block was introduced and a 10 dB gain antenna. Um, and Obviously, nine, near minus 90 dBm is fairly aggressive in terms of uh, relevant to, uh, or well, yeah, in respect to nominal GNSS signal levels to make sure to really incentivize, so to speak, the uh, receiver to lock onto that much stronger signal. So, what were the devices on the test? So, there were a range of commercial the available drones tested all, well, from just drones that were 0.7 pounds to up to 9.4 pounds, the quadcopter you can see on the right-hand side. So really a range of drones being tested here. What were the test scenarios that were run? So I've kind of grouped them um, by starting position and by test case that was aimed to be run. So the Base start position was the drone hovering at one meter height. And then a um, and then it had been hovering at 30 meters height, so much, much higher. Then the test case, one of the test cases was um, start trying to make the drone go up in height. So starting, well, first introducing a signal, which is completely in line for 10 seconds with where the drone currently is and then spoofing it up to 1600 meters of height. So making it essentially a fly up. The other bit is again, initially starting with a 10 second of static position at that higher power level to make the receiver in the drone lock into that stronger signal and then accelerating it um, for five seconds to a final speed of either 0.5 or one meters per second. So. Um, that you could see, for example, here on the right-hand side, an expected result would be that if you provide after 10 seconds of um, the static uh, signal, you provide them a spoofing signal in that direction while the drone 
it's got a command from the operator to stay static so it would uh, because the receiver is locked onto a new signal which is now moving right it will try to cor correct and go in the opposite direction to, to, so to the south in this instance so i think well, rather than just talking about the theoretical results i do want to show a video of the actual uh, results with one of the drones next so i'm just going to wait for that to load briefly so you can see here this is one of the drones hovering uh, initially at one point um, we're going to switch on the spoofing signal you will be able to see that briefly as the drone will slightly skid at one point when it kind of locks on to the spoofing signal the stronger signal in this case and then yeah so yeah there you go now it's kind of like locked onto that new signal and then you will soon see the effect of the spoofing of the drone yeah rapidly moving to the south and at one point you will see yeah this is the point when there's manual operator intervention and the drone is stabilized again so this was one of the drones um again this testing was done for a lot of them so what were the results so for the hovering at well one meter and 30 meters and especially the uh spoofing for lateral motion so um spoofing it to the north motion to the si uh, south 80 percent of all tested drones were successfully spoofed um the result were that there was acceleration in the expected direction however not at constant speed but always increasing increment speed and changes of height and just really a rate motion almost and the hypothesis of why that was the case is because the sensor fusion filters really became unstable the drone couldn't find a good position anymore it was just going fairly um haywire in this case the remaining drones actually funnily enough showed movement on the remote control but did not react in reality which could be an indication that what well, if it got an insecure position it's just going to stay static as a bit of a fail safe and then but nonetheless on the remote control you can see it here on the right hand side it displayed something where the drone was static also if you're in a beyond visual line of sight situation probably a bit worrying if the remote control what the drone is transmitting isn't matching up to where the drone actually is if we look at the test case where we try to or where, the, where it was tried to spoof the drone up so kind of like make it go up 1600 meters there actually wasn't any substantial effect observed there and the hypothesis of why that is the case is because um, the height control in a lot of the drones is most likely going to be rather a combination of barometric and ultrasonic sensors rather than the GPS which does make sense because the z-axis of GPS especially with commercial receivers is well it's, it's just not as precise so you would probably go with barometric or ultrasonic sensors for height control and therefore a in spoofing of the GPS is not necessarily going to change the height of the system or where it flies to be precise um so a conclusion of their field testing so i think the first thing that was able to be demonstrated is that the spiron field simulator is capable of reliably producing realistic gnss signals in synchronization with the live sky which are suitable for fairly advanced spoofing testing a key thing is definitely to have a secure parameter and a well-trained drone pilot um, in order because of the unpredictable drone behavior and I think here on the right hand side well if you go to the area where that test is you can still see some drones in trees so um yeah that that well yeah so experienced pilots plus the parameters are key from an education perspective commercial drones are generally vulnerable to relatively simple spoofing attacks uh, uh but horizontal plane spoofing is a much larger threat than height or vertical spoofing and i think on an even wider point for the assurance of drone platforms but also other platforms the field spoofing tests can form a suitable complement 
to lab-based testing um, yeah, to make sure that things that you test in the lab are behaving the same way in the field when there's even more effects present. So, well, that was my last slide and I will now hand over to Chris um, to talk to you about lab-based spoofing. All right, thank you very much, Jan. That was an awesome presentation. Um, like Dan said, I'm gonna be talking about lab-based spoofing, which is a little bit on the opposite end of the spectrum from the open air testing that Jan was just describing. Um, so the first you know, question, and I think Paul really hit well on this, is why, why would we wanna do lab-based spoofing in, instead of, or supplement to uh, over the air testing? And, and the first, of course, is you get flexibility. You, have, you can choose anytime, anywhere. You have full control over the signal and the environment, which means that you can add jammers, you can add your spoofers, you can add multipath atmospheric effects and so forth. So just having that control over the environment um, is really important uh, to be able to fully test your, your receiver in ways that you may not be able to just with the open air test. Um, also on that point is being able to recreate past events. Um, there are a number of open air tests that are available um, such as Pentax or NAFES that receiver manufacturers will go to. Uh, but of course, during those events, sometimes they'll find uh, that the receiver behaves incorrectly. And so they want to be able to recreate that event instead of waiting an entire year, they can now recreate that in, in a simulator so that they can test that over and over again and test that their, their updates took effect correctly. Um, Paul mentioned this, and it's a, a key point worth mentioning again. It's the security. When you're testing open air, that those signals are available for anybody to capture when if they're nearby. And it, it, those threats that you're testing against, you may not want your enemies or competitors knowing um, about that type of scenario that you're, that you're testing against. So keeping it inside of the lab just ensures the security of the signals that they're not being leaked um, and also that threat environment that you're testing against. Um, and of course, no need to, to get the permits, which can be a long and lengthy process. And then the, the last point there is repeatability. Um, being able to, to run your receiver in the same environment over and over again is crucial for regression testing, um, being able to characterize the receiver and um, making sure that your, your algorithms are behaving appropriately. So spoofing is something that you've been able to do in our simulators for a long time. Spoofing itself is, is nothing new. However, we did make the process of generating a spoofing scenario significantly easier with the introduction of a uh, spoofing feature key. This spoofing feature key is fully embedded into Pause app, and it leverages the existing GUIs and, and tools that are available. That makes it easy if you already know how to set up a pause up scenario, setting up a spoofing scenario is a very simple extension of that. Um, because it is fully integrated into pause up, you don't need any third party equipment or tools. There are a number of simulators out there that require you to, when you do a spoofing scenario, to have multiple RF spigots, one for the true constellation and another for that spoofer. Uh, and then they require an external combiner. We don't need that. We do all of our combining internally to create a single composite signal on, on that one RF output. Um, so just makes that process easy and, and scalable. A few of the key features or spoofing attacks that you can do is something as simple as a, a trajectory spoofing. And Jan's video showed that, and I'm also gonna show a similar one using a lab-based approach where you have the true position of the, of the receiver, and then that spoof trajectory is gonna either move or diverge, or just try to trick the receiver to, to believe that it's in a different position. Uh, you can do a simple navigation uh, spoofing attacks, and navigation messages that could be corrupted in the spoofed constellation. So you can have one of the satellites, um, the spoof satellites reporting that another satellite is unhealthy in the hopes that if the receiver is tracking that spoofed constellation, it will throw out some of the satellites that are, have been marked unhealthy in that spoofed constellation. And of course you can do uh, simple meekening attacks, which are, are very simple repeaters. And in pause app, you can define the time delay between the true constellation and that repeater. 
A few other highlights um, worth noting is the number of spoof constellations inside of FOSAP per scenario. You can have over 10 spoofing constellations that are independent of each other. So you can have 10 different spoof tra trajectories. You can have um, that full control over each of the constellations. And then for each of those constellations, you can have over 60 ground transmitters. So you can see that this is a very flexible and very robust uh, solution, and you can create very sophisticated scenarios. Um, a few things uh, to note, the ground transmitters, you can set them to have modeled power levels, in which case we will take the distance from the spoof transmitter to the receiver into account when defining the, the power levels. So the farther away that the receiver moves away from the transmitter, the weaker the signal will become. Um, or you can set that to be mo um, a fixed power level. Uh, also important for the RF when defining or, or modeling the, the pseudo range, the appropriate way of defining a pseudo range in a spoofed environment is taking the pseudo range from the satellites to the spoof transmitter and then from the transmitter to the receiver. So that all has to be correctly calculated and modeled. Um, and of course, we model the signal angle of arrival. Now, this is pretty important when you're wanting to, to test um, sophisticated anti-spoofing algorithms using antenna electronics. You can pair this with a wavefront simulator. This would allow you to perform some tests such as um, if you know from the almanac that SB31 is directly overhead, um, yet the angle of arrival as reported from, from the SERPA is coming from the horizon, you have a pretty good idea that you're, you're being spoofed or that that signal is a spoofed signal. So you can steer a null in that direction to mitigate the, the spoofing threat. Uh, so those are some of the things that you can do. So like Jan, I decided to create a, a very simple case study using this spoofing feature. We used a commercially available uh, U-Blocks receiver and defined a very simple trajectory. In this scenario, the ground trans we only have a single ground transmitter uh, spoofer, and it is at 6 dB hotter than the true constellation, and it is on at the start of the scenario. So the receiver at the very beginning, it's going to try to acquire the signals, and it's the, the spoofing constellation is going to be present. Uh, uh, so the uh, video here uh, that you can see, we have the true position being reported by PAUSE app. This is being rendered in X-Plane. And that red sphere that just uh, showed up, that is the position as reported by the receiver. So we're using uh, Xplain for the visualization tool. We have a utility called Symbiz that connects POSAP to Xplain, and it's being driven. So this is a unique way of visualizing uh, the, the air. As you can see, the, the red sphere uh, will move a little bit. And as we start taking off, you can see that that red sphere has moved off from the airplane, that, that was the receiver estimated its position, and of course that was an error. Now, the receiver is um, feeding its location to X-Plane through NMEA data, so that's being updated uh, about once a second, and we extrapolate that uh, so that the graphics are just are, are smooth. And so you can see that uh, we're flying, the that red sphere gets updated and it moves around. And so far, even though it has acquired a location off of that spoofing constellation, it's well aligned. Um, now here in the next few moments, we're going to take that spoofing trajectory and we're going to pull that off to the right. And you can see now that it is the, the receiver is being moved over. And now here we have turned off the spoofing, cons the, the spoofing transmitter. So right now the receiver has lost lock and it's going through its reacquisition cycle. So you can see for this U-Blocks receiver, it's taken a little bit of time to reacquire and generate a new NAS solution. This could be due to the fact that it was just spoofed or possibly because the vehicle is, is currently in motion. And so this is a very simple tool. Like I said, it, it makes it very easy for users to generate that spoofing scenario. And if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to ask or you can reach out to uh, your local representative and we'd be more than happy to get you that information. All right, I'll, I'll hand this back over to Aurora.
Awesome, thank you. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and jump into our Q&A portion. Alrighty, so the first question here, um, are you familiar with the giant modeling SW package? If so, have you utilized with GPS simulations? I'm assuming that question is for me, so I'll answer that. And the answer is absolutely, we're familiar with it. And in fact, uh, I spoke a lot about uh, needing those uh, radio frequency authorizations in order to broadcast out in the field. We use Giant to uh, produce those simulations of what we expect to see in the field. And that is actually part of the approval process. We won't get approved without it. So yes, we're very familiar with uh, with Giant and we, we use it frequently. Perfect. Okay, the next question I have here is, how accurate are the GPS live signal and the signal generated by the field simulator synchronized in terms of time and phase? I suppose that's one for me. Um, so I think as, as also briefly mentioned, with the current standard of reference receiver we, we use mostly, that's 200 nanoseconds in terms of synchronization. There, there is, there is room. Well, we can, we can bring that in tighter, especially if we use different receivers. But currently, the answer to that is below 100 nanoseconds. Perfect. Okay, another question here. Um, it says, in the case study with the U blocks just shown, what constellation were being spoofed? Uh, great question. For that, we were just using the CA code. Uh, a one, no one band. All right, fantastic. All right, um, Paul, I believe this one's another question going to you. Um, what is the certification process before the user gets the simulator? Um, I'm going to assume that this is with respect to us taking our simulation capability to other facilities. And uh, if I'm correct in that, and please give a follow-up question if I'm missing the mark here, uh, we actually send our operators out. So there's the, the certification is really on our end to make sure that we have certified operators. Um, the facility itself uh, uh, usually takes care of its own certifications to bring equipment into their laboratories. And uh, in most cases, that's not a problem, or at least it's not a problem that we see. So it, that's coordinated as part of the test program. Over. Awesome. Thank you. OK, another question here. Do the spoofing simulations using Spirant take into account Doppler shifts for high-speed vehicles? I will. Well, I think that was that popped up during the field simulator session. So what I'd say, and maybe even partially back to Christopher's session, um, in the fully simulated way, absolutely, um, yeah, it's all taken into account uh, in reference both with the spoofing transmitter to the uh, vehicle and the test, and obviously also with the sky constellation. The field simulator, because it runs the same version of software, you can also model Doppler shifts um, for a high-speed vehicle. That's, it's obviously a bit more complicated there because you've got some environment inputs that are not necessarily always known to the simulator, but there are means through our SimGen software for, of accounting for that also with the field simulator on possibly moving targets. Fantastic, thank you. All right, we're gonna do one more question here before we wrap up. All right, and this one says, give me one second here. Um, this one was a pre-submitted question. So this one is, where do signals of opportunity fit into the emerging PNT cybersecurity landscape? Um. I'll go first. Uh, the others may want to chime in as well. Uh, from our perspective, we're still figuring that out because uh, signals of opportunity are certainly being leveraged into a lot of research and development to see how they can best 
serve our uh, uh, military and DOD operations. Um, as they mature, we're certainly going to need to upgrade our simulation capabilities to include those signals. Um, right now, there, there's a lot of very, very early developmental testing going on, and, and in some cases, we can simulate uh, what we think those signals are going to look like and how they might be leveraged, but uh, uh, we're not quite there yet, and there are a lot of signals of opportunity that are being investigated right now. So instead of honing in on one particular signal and, and really ringing it out, uh, we're, we're remaining very flexible until we get a little bit more direction on what we need to be doing. Um, maybe some of the other uh, presenters would like to comment on that as well. Yeah, no, certainly I can. I think that was a, a very good summary from a user perspective, from a test and measurement provider perspective. I think for us, it's important that, um, and we've worked over that over the last few years to make sure that our, well, what is in the core, a GNSS plus INS or IMU test platform is able to bring in signals of opportunity, allow users to try those early. And we have a few mechanisms how we can bring in those either through, um, well, working with provide IQ data and bring that in completely in sync with our GNSS signals or work through more intrinsic flexibility in generating emerging signals so that we can give that flexibility to the users if and when those emerge. Because as Paul rightly said, there is a lot of them being considered. And I don't think anybody has fully landed on yet what they are going to be. But for us as a test and measurement provider, the key thing is that we provide a bit of a sandbox for people to try them in those early phases, um, because that is the by far the cheapest and most efficient way of actually seeing what it worked before you go out and implement it, uh, how it all would work together in simulation. So we are engaged there because well, we see our role there as providing that sandbox to help the users figure out what's going to be the most efficient uh, way for them forward. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and jump into a few closing remarks. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Field and Laboratory Navigation Warfare Simulation, brought to you by GPS World and our sponsor of the event, Spirant Federal Systems. If we were not able to answer your questions during the presentation or Q&A session, your questions will be forwarded to the panelists to be addressed via email. And if you have any additional questions for myself or our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on the slide. The resources panel houses a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download. To access this panel, click the green icon at the far right end of the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars. And upcoming webinars from GPS World also will be posted to that page. Thank you for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.